everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. I know I am. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, this concept of closing the loop when you're doing uh, data analysis and data science. Um, in particular, uh, an open source tool called Lightning that, that plugs in and works really nicely with Spark. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, my background's in engineering and math, so I'm kind of a full stack web developer, um, getting more into the data science side recently. Do a lot of data visualization work. Um, and yeah, currently I, I work with uh, 538 and Freeman Lab and also a, a digital art nonprofit, Rhizome. Um, and so in the spirit of the data science track, um, I want to start with a question to sort of motivate, you know, why is this, this work important? Um, and so the question is, what is data science really? I mean, is it just a, you know, a, a better term for statistics so that people can make their companies sound more exciting and more fascinating? Uh, or is it really something bigger and better than that? And I claim that yes, it is. It's like this whole system uh, that, that we've created for you know, making very informed decisions based on data, where sort of statistics is just one component of this whole, whole process. And so you know, we go, we start with collection of data, whether it be from zebrafish brains or you know, from log files coming in from your server or opens on your app. Uh, we collect that, we do some data munging, put it into our processing systems, you know, spit out some sort of informative visualization, or maybe, maybe that's just text, and we make some sort of decision about this. Um, in, in reality, it's not quite so linear. Um, so I like to think about this as kind of a finite state machine, where, you know, at any of these stages, we can kind of decide that, you know, right now it's necessary to go back to any of the other stages based on, based on what we've learned so far. Um, there's no reason to continue all the way down, you know, the line if we've, if we've learned something and figured out that what we're doing now doesn't really make sense because this whole process really is about learning and making informed decisions. Um, and so the step that I really want to talk, uh, you know, in depth about today is, is visualization and how that, that fits in. So, you know, where does data visualization fit in modern workflows? And to get started, maybe the, the good thing to think about is like, what is the perfect data visualization workflow look like, especially if we're using all these modern tools that are interactive like Spark. Um, and so for me, it's something that is uh, web-based, first of all. It's portable. You can kind of see it anywhere, um, embed it anywhere you want. Um, customizable. You're not, you're not limited to uh, you know, exactly what, what comes out of the box and uh, decoupled from analysis. And what I mean when I say decoupled from analysis is really like the logic where you're creating these visualizations or like the, the grammar of what you know, your output looks like, that shouldn't be in the same place that you're actually doing these machine learning, learning algorithms. Because that's just two completely different sets of things. Um, and and you know, it, it's things that different people are, are skilled at. And you know, by separating these things, we can, we can make a much more powerful system and a much more informative system. Um, and so introducing Lightning and Spark. Uh, this is uh, Lightning. It's a data visualization server. So the way that it works is uh, I call it an API for data visualizations. So you have a server running somewhere. Um, and we provide all of these client libraries, um, Python, Scala, uh, Node.js. Um, you can even do it with Bash if you want. Um, basically, you're, you're piping data into the server. You're telling it what form it should take. And the server creates and handles all the data management and all the sort of building of the output. Um, and it's all completely customizable. So you can plug in things like D3 and 3.js. Um, and it's since, you know, because it's web-based and because it's using these JavaScript technologies, it's all interactive, too. So nothing's just a, a static image. And so, yep, that's what I just covered. Um, so I want to do, like, a, you know, little demo of what that looks like. So if you have a server running, you get this screen here. Um, so there's Welcome to Lightning. Um, you can tab over. And basically, it's like, in the spirit of, these new, new notebook technologies, you, you sort of like scope your, uh, your visualization sessions to, to these things. 
And so if you want to actually start uh, creating visualizations with this, it's pretty easy. I'll show you. Um, so here I have a Scala prompt open. Um, to actually create a visualization and send it to this Lightning server, the uh, only things I really need to do is, sorry, one second. Let me move this up a little. So first you just import the library. Um, then you tell Lightning, hey, um, I have this server running. Uh, you can point it to a URL, um, but I'm running it on localhost right now, so I'm just going to instantiate it here. Um, you can create one of these sessions, or you can just start you know, plotting, plotting your visualization. So this here says, Lightning, create a line plot, and here's my data. So when I do this, it's going to create a new session here. 114, and there's my line plot. Um, and since this is all you know, live stuff, you can create another one. It should show up. There should be two here now. Um, you know, you scatter plots. So now there's a scatter plot, um, and this is just kind of like the really basic idea of what what you're doing. You're you're posting data to a server, and it's creating visualization. So we can get a bit more in depth with this. I'm going to go through a few examples now. So the first one is a, uh, an example with Scala using the, the GraphX uh, library on Spark. So this is running in a uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, to get started, uh, we just first have to import the Lightning client uh, once, once the kernel finishes. Um, and really, this is, this is quite cool because everything is so portable that you know, not only does it live on the server, but it can follow you around. So like, if we're in the Jupyter Notebook, now all of a sudden we can start seeing these visualizations appear in the Jupyter Notebook. Or if you, know, if you want to embed it on your blog, it's there. If you want to embed it in other places, it's, it's there. It's wherever you want it. And so to get started, we just import the libraries. So this takes a second to start up. And right, we instantiate it. We tell it, OK, we have a Lightning server running on localhost, and we want it to be in notebook mode. So that starts. Um, and now I'm going to load in some data. This data source is um, it's from the, the Allen Institute on brainmap.org. Um, what it's, it's showing is the connectivity of regions of a mouse brain. Um, so the, uh, the nodes of the graph represent a certain region, and the edges can, uh, that are connecting them represent how uh, similar the genes that they're expressing are. So we're going to try to show that now with, with Scala and GraphX. So I just loaded it in. Um, I'm going to run this now. Just get the links and show a, uh, a, force, a force graph diagram. So there it is. And you know what just happened when I ran this command is that the, the Scala client did a post request to the server. It said, I have these links, and I want it to be a force diagram. The server says, OK, it, ing it ingests the data. It goes out, it creates a web page with this D3-based force diagram on it, and it returns a link so that you can embed it here. Um, and these are completely interactive. You can zoom in, you know, see all these links, sort of select certain portions that you want, do all sorts of things. Um, and they're, you know, they're also customizable. So if you want to start doing some more in-depth analysis, um, for example, if we want to look at the uh, degrees of the, of the nodes on our graph, we can do that. Um, so this is just going to you know, sort, sort everything by degrees and color it uh, so that uh, the, the nodes with the most degrees are the most prominent on this, on this plot. So it shows up. Um, we can zoom out. And we see that you know, around the edges, we have these sort of disconnected or low degree nodes. And then in this sort of cluster here, it's all very, very brightly colored. Um, and finally, um, 
We can do things like connected components with this. Um, so just to see how the graph looks with the connected components, we can bring that up. And you can see here's a diagram. It's very clear you know, which parts of this graph are connected from this and, and which are not. And this is exciting because this is, now we're running Scala in an interactive environment and being able to have all these interactive plots. Um, and sort of what I'll show you in a second is how you can actually go from this plot and, and these selections to, to informing the next step of your analysis. Um, and so not only can we do Scala, we can do Python as well. So this is a notebook running PySpark. Uh, and I'm going to do a demo of... Uh, how we can display streaming data now using Spark Streaming. So the first step, just import the libraries. I'm going to go ahead and create a, uh, a streaming context. And then I'm going to say, listen to a, a socket that I have open on, uh, on localhost. Um, this is just, I have a Netcat server running, I'll, I'll pull it up in a second. So it's just a really simple example of how you can, how you can pipe data into Spark Streaming and then output to a visualization. Um, so imp import some more libraries. Um, start off the client, tell it running in notebook mode. And uh, here we go. So this is going to say, all right, I want to create a visualization that is a streaming scatter plot. And I'm just going to seed it with some initial random data. Now, I want to define an update function. So the, the visualization needs to know, OK, data is coming in. Spark Streaming is getting these, these x, y coordinates. What do I do with them? So this update function just says, you know, extract, do the necessary extraction from Spark Streaming, and append those to the, the current scatterplot. So I tell that uh, Spark streaming context that for every RDD, I'm going to use that update function. And now I'm going to paint my visualization. OK. So now the next thing to do is to actually start Spark streaming. And OK, so over here, this is my Netcat server. So every time I type in a line here, it's, it's going to send this message to Spark Streaming, and this should be uh, displayed in the, in the scatter plot. So if I type in a few things, you can see that this, the plot starts to change. Um, you know, and this is kind of a toy example, but you can imagine that you can, you can really hook this up to anything that, that hooks into Spark Streaming. So this is powerful because now all of a sudden you're in your notebook environment and you can immediately start to see exactly what's happening um, you know, in just a few lines of code. Okay. So the next example uh, here is going to be using a, a data analysis library called Thunder that's built on top of Spark. Um, and it's going to be using some uh, neuroscience data from uh, the Freeman lab that was put together by uh, Nicholas, I uh, <laughs> can't pronounce his last name, and Kari Savota. Sorry, Nick, <laughs> if you're watching this. Um, and so the, the first thing to do is to say, OK, where is my data located? Um, and it's, it's hosted on S3. So this notebook now is actually running on uh, an EC2 cluster that's running Spark. So we have access to these big data sets on S3. So I can run that. Actually, hopefully I can run that. Okay. 
is uh, the conference Wi-Fi conundrum, I believe. OK, well, if this is not loading, I can show you a uh, local example of, of how I can do that. So back to our uh, Lightning uh, PySpark notebook. Um, I can uh, go ahead and actually get some data. I'm going to use example data that we have, um, just because that's easiest. This. So here we go. I'm going to start a new notebook. So I'm going to import some libraries, and I'm going to start to um, try to draw some images here. So I can instantiate lightning. This is always what I need to do to start. And I can get, um, you know, load in some image from this example data set that's available through sklearn and paint it to the screen. So, like I said, Lightning has all these different um, plot types. You know, you saw a li line streaming, uh, scatter plot. Um, one, of the, one of the types is image. And um, not only image, but we have uh, image poly, which means that uh, so you can take an image and actually start to interact with it. So uh, for example, you can start to you know, highlight these certain coordinates. I don't know if this is going to, there we go. Maybe this is going to work after all. So yeah, you can take an image and start to highlight coordinates. And I can draw it. And then, so once I have these regions drawn, I can do vis.points. This is great live coding. OK, so this is actually giving me um, an array of every single point that I've highlighted here on the image. Um, and so what you can do with that is you can actually do you know, sort of analyses from, from the interaction. So if you start to um, you know, draw these points, then under the hood, there's um, some events firing off that's telling your server, OK, you know, the user just uh, highlighted this. Here's our, here's our you know, array of coordinates that we have. Um, and this is really powerful uh, for two reasons. Um, one, because you know, it's, it's exposing, obviously, these, these points here. But two, we, we expose um, event handlers for this. So when you do this, you can actually hook into, in Python, hook into events that are happening in, in JavaScript. Um, so, and I'll show you what that looks like now. So you basically define a handler, um, and it's going to just pass in some data. And just the easiest thing to do is kind of display the data. So I'll do that. And then I can say, um, on my visualization, 
I want it to listen to a uh, selection event. Um, and then when that selection event happens, I'm going to tell it to use this handler. OK. So I'll do this again. And now if I select a point here, hopefully a selection event fired off. And you can see that this variable d is um, actually populated now. And so the, the really cool thing about this is that because you have callbacks going from JavaScript to Python now, um, you can actually imagine that in this event handler, you're launching off new Spark jobs. So when you highlight a region, for example, um, the use case that we do in, uh, in Jeremy's lab in the, the neuroscience case is that there's, there's images of, of brains. So over, over a period of time, a brain has, a, you know, every neuron is in a certain state. So you can look at these images, say, I want to look at this neuron. And then I, because I did that, Spark can go off and actually analyze that everything's happened to this particular neuron. Um, this is all, and this can all be done from inside, inside the notebook with like no extra effort on your part. Um, and so I think the, the, the connection of these callbacks is, is really powerful. Um, and I wish that uh, this notebook had worked so I could show you a little better. But that's all right. OK, so getting back to it. Um, the final thing that I, that I want to talk about is, um, you know, not only do we, do we hook into all these platforms and provide some basic visualization types for you, um, but we actually allow you to customize, uh, you know, basically every, everything that you can imagine here. So in a scatterplot, for example, I can go in, make sure I better do this. In my scatter plot, I can go in and actually see the exact JavaScript code that's generating these things. Um, so if I, you know, if I wanted, uh, maybe I didn't like how the axes were laid out or something, um, I could go in and, you know, change even the, the CSS styles. Um, so maybe I wanted, like, I don't know, for some reason the grid takes to be a different color. I can change this, um, and then every visualization that I've created with this, um, it should now have these properties as well. So if you remember those things I was creating with Scala before, um, these, uh, these can get updated based on how you're, how you're doing this here. So if you, you know, any sort of JavaScript that you want to do, if you want to add some tool tips in here or something like that, um, you can do that. And not only can you do that, um, but you can also uh, fetch down and create your own custom visualizations that plug in. So everything's completely library agnostic. Um, you know, we support D3, we support 3JS. Um, we just expose a common interface. Um, so if you conform to that interface, then anything you can draw to the screen will work. Um, so for example, I have a gist of a, uh, of a certain visualization here um, that, uh, this is from 538 actually. So this gist, I can point it, uh, my server to this URL, and I can actually preview this thing here. So now that just went out, um, it fetched down that, that gist, it, you know, put it into the format for Lightning. And now if I wanted to, I could go into Scala and start creating this thing with real data. Um, I could go into my Python client and start creating things with this real data. Um, and this is really powerful because there's not really a good way for the community to share things like this right now. There's a lot of repeated effort here. Um, and so I hope that people start using this to um, sort of share their code and help avoid some duplication. Um, and really, that's, that's the final thing I wanted to talk about. So if anyone has any questions, uh, I'll take them now, but I just wanted to say thanks for listening. Um, thank you. Thanks. Hi, a uh, very nice presentation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, how does it differ from Bokeh? Um, so 
It differs from Boca in, in the sense that uh, it's a bit more decoupled from Boca. So Boca's, when you're, when, you're, when you're in Boca, you're in Python, and everything that you're doing is, is happening there. It's like all one like, nice encapsulated thing. Lightning breaks this out, and that's what allows you to you know, use it from Scala, use it from Node. Um, and that's also what allows you to start embedding it in, uh, in these other places, too. So it's, you know, it's, it's not quite as self-contained. Like, you actually have to have a server running somewhere um, separate from your Python thread. But it, I, I feel that that's, that's a powerful compromise to make. Um, it also allows you to do the custom visualizations that Boca doesn't really allow you to do. Other questions? Yes. So the, the, the JavaScript itself is uh, generated at the server side and sent to the, sent to the browser? or is just the Scala? Is, so, uh, what is, is it SVG? Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. So, when Scala, so using Scala for example, Scala does a post request and it, this, it tells the server that it wants to create a visualization. And under the hood, um, that creates like a permalink URL for that visualization. And that, that URL has all the markup, all the JavaScript, and everything generated from the server there. Um, I have a question, then mm -hmm. how long is the link going to be retained and stuff like that? Like, I'm sorry, could you repeat it? Like you said the, the, the library generate the link and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So then like, do you manage all those data? Or? Yeah, so well, we don't provide a server for you. It's like you're running your own server in this case. Oh, um, we provide a lot of ways to make it really easy to run the server, but it's, it's sort of up to whoever's running the server how long that, that's living. Okay, we can take additional questions outside then. Okay. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you.